In It Together SC and Coping with Trey Taylor, giving you info and advice to help you thrive and survive in life. Because we'll always be coping with something. Go. Thank you again so much for joining us for Coping with Trey Daler. Today, we're coping with the amazing story of Bella LaCosta Green. You may have heard about this interesting piece of history on Good Morning America, NPR, or so many other broadcast entities. The New York Times bestseller tells the story of a Black woman passing as white who helped financier J.P. Morgan build his personal manuscript and art collection. Marie Benedict and Victoria... Christopher Mary join us today, along with the folks from the Richland County Public Library. Thank you, ladies, so much for joining us today. I am fascinated by the story and so glad that you could join us today to talk about it and introduce the people of Columbia, which the story does have a South Carolina kind of connection to it, to this amazing story. Well, thank you for having us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We're going to talk to Marie mm-hmm. and Victoria coming up in just a short, short, but first, your COVID community updates. The Comet gives me a reliable source of transportation. It's very convenient to me, and they have wonderful drivers. It's clean, and it builds community. It's fun to meet people. It makes me feel, like, really independent. It's just fun. Um, it's always going to be there, and it gets me everywhere I need to go. We try to ride every single day. Comet is our livelihood. Thank you again so much for joining us for Coping with Trey Taylor. Today we're coping with the interesting concept of passing, something we're actually still doing today. Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Mary join us. They are the authors of a New York Times best-selling book that tells the story of a woman who helped financier J.P. Morgan build his personal manuscript and art collection while passing as white. Her name, Bella DaCosta Green. Ladies, thank you again so much for joining us today. We appreciate you so much. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Yeah, so so um, t- talk about coping. And that's this, that's what we talk about on this show. But um, how were African-Americans able to deal with, hide, navigate through life in the, 19, in the 1800s passing? Well, that was just um, a tool that some use. Um, It's no different than what people do today. Everyone uses their advantage, whatever advantage they have, to be equal. Because um, just living, unfortunately, in this country, you're not equal. So you look for all of the advantages. And um, depending on someone's complexion, they were able to pass pretty, um, I will say the word easily, though there were a lot of things, but they were able to pass. Passing is not about passing to Black people. Passing is about passing to white people. Right. That's a great point, Victoria, because, so are you saying Black folks know when you're passing, white folks don't? Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yep, that sums it up. Yeah, that sums it up. The interesting thing about that, and and I don't think we have talked about it enough, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, I think we all know what passing is, and you know, but I don't think we understand. And you said something that that was just interesting to me. You said use the advantages that you have to get where you want, and in this case, and in many cases, um, and in the eighteen hundreds and beyond, being light complected and fine hair was an advantage. Well, yes, it was an advantage to be considered equal. So I'm only talking about advantages in terms of um, being considered equal in this country. One of the things that Marie and I worked really hard on was to show the struggles and the sacrifices, all the things people gave up to pass. They weren't passing to be white. They were passing to be equal. Mm. And mm. and I think that's a very, that's the point that I think Marie and I wanted to make, right, Marie, about this Absolutely. book? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, oh, I think what it's much about didn't want to be black. You just didn't want to be equal or unequal. Right. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think one of the important things that Victoria and I really, as she just mentioned, strove to do in this book is to, is to show the terrible sacrifices that went along with passing um, and the necessity for it, given the historical context that we were writing about. You know, the time period, you know, one of the ties to Columbia is that Belle de Costa Green's father, Richard T. Greener, Greener. first black mm -hmm. graduate of Harvard, was the first black professor at the University of South Carolina. And when he and his wife, Belle's mother, Genevieve Fleet, came to the University of South Carolina, it was a time of great possibility in our country. It was the Reconstruction, um, the Civil Rights Act of 1875 had been enacted, and they entered into this situation hoping that there would never be a need for passing, mm. hoping that they would be able to be equal and protected and safe in our society without presenting as white, right? Mm -hmm. And during their time period at the University of South Carolina, that, that started to change in our country and that promise started to erode. And, and that's what kind of gave rise to the necessity later on for their daughter, Belle, to pass. Yeah. Uh, do you guys think that, if not so much in this situation, but in most passing situations, was there a conversation that went on among your family or did you just do it and then leave? Because of course, if you are in the same place where you were born and raised and people knew who your parents were, it would be more challenging to pass, so to speak. Yeah, I think most people who pass moved away. It just depended on their circumstances. Yeah. Um, if they were doing it singularly as just one individual going out um, with Belle de Costa Green and her family, it was her mother who kind of made the decision, but it wasn't a conversation. It was just gradually mm. um, moving into a white neighborhood, um, people assuming they were white, right, and they just right. gradually uh, continued doing this. Um, and so I don't think it was until Richard T. Greener who said he was not doing it. I don't think it was until the, he left that there was a conversation about it, but I think it just depended on the family. Right. Uh, in, in their situation, the um, it's not as though um, their family set out to pass, right? In fact, Richard T. Greener stood for the exact opposite. He stood for the, the, the right to be as you are in society and be free and equal regardless of the shade of your skin. Right. So when people started to slowly make those assumptions about their family, and Genevieve could kind of see what was happening in their country and she wanted to protect her children and she allowed people to make those assumptions. That's when the passing began, but it was never intentional. Yeah, we're talking to uh, Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. They are the authors of The Librarian. It's a fascinating book uh, that was a New York Times bestseller, as a matter of fact. The story of a Black woman passing as white who eventually helped financier J.P. Morgan build his personal manuscript and art collection. We're talking now about uh, one of the themes of the book, uh, one of the things that you guys really delve into, which is the, um, the situation about passing. Uh, did, did Black folk who knew that their uh, colleagues, friends, family members were passing, did they ever either confront their family members or snitch? Are you talking about Bell's situation or in yeah. general? Well, we, either. Yeah, in, in um, Bell's situation, we don't think anyone snitched on them. But <laughs> I, um, Marie and I, the reason this book is fiction um, it's based on a real person, but it's fiction okay. <laughs> because we don't know yeah. the conversations they had. So we had to imagine what would have happened. And so in this situation, we imagine the fictional part that they return to their family. And I cannot see that their family would just say, oh, welcome home. You know, right. you, you don't want to be part of us, but we're glad to have you now. Yeah. Um, and so we we're pretty sure that often there was confrontation yeah mm -hmm. uh and i think marie you read a book that said mm -hmm. that there was often confrontation correct yeah we didn't have because we didn't have any writings by Belle de costa green or her family right. members about how she felt about passing or how they felt about their family passing we kind of did much broader research into passing at that time 
the impact on families, sacrifices, sort of personal situations. Um, the book's called A Chosen Exile by Allison Hobbs, and it really explores very real life historical situations. And that's something that we did see. We, we got to see different, the way in which passing manifested, um, both for the person who was passing and the families that were left behind. And, and that's kind of what gave rise to the sort of conversations that we imagined in the book. You mentioned, Marie, that the story does have a South Carolina connection. Again, um, mm -hmm. Belle Marion Greener, who was Bella LaCosta in, the, in your story, was born in uh, 1879, the daughter of Richard Greener, first African-American to serve on the faculty of the University of South Carolina. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, back in 2018, a statue uh, of him mm -hmm. was erected on the campus. How much of his background, and you mentioned a little bit about how he felt about the whole idea of passing, how much more of his background uh, does the book delve into? Probably not as much as we'd like, since it's about the Costa Green story yeah. and, and not um, and not Richard T. Greener's story. But you know, to, in order to understand who Belle was and the influences upon her and who, how she really rose up to become this remarkable woman, we did delve into Richard T. Greener. You know, investigating his life, the time period in which he lived, his legacy. You know, he's somebody who was very well known during his time period, but yeah. would have been forgotten in, in more recent times. But his writings, um, some essays he wrote, The White Problem in particular, are so powerful and so timely mm -hmm. that Victoria often, and I often say we wish we could have, without deterring from Bell's story, right. dealt into the life and times of Richard T. Greener. And we're so excited to actually be able to be on the campus, be in front of, in front of that statue and with right. some of the people who are instrumental in, in kind of making that happen and starting this lecture series in his name. Maybe that'll be a great uh, day to announce that you're doing a part two about him. <laughs> we definitely are so excited that people are learning more about him for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, because I wonder, does his, uh, did him being a professor at the University of South Carolina affect or influence her um, in any oh, yeah. way? Yeah, you know. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, because he was also the librarian there and she ended up being a librarian. Being a librarian. And so, yeah, and so we really believe that she just, she followed in her father's footsteps in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. Right. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot about Richard T. Greener that people don't know, how much of a civil rights activist he was. Absolutely. How he was a contemporary of Frederick Douglass. Um, and if there had been anyone to keep his legacy going the way mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass, his exactly. wife did, we would know more about Richard mm -hmm. T. Greener today. Yeah, and how much more South Carolina had to do with the civil rights movement also. I mean, and mm -hmm. there are civil rights activists that did come out of South Carolina, of course. But again, I think the impact and influence of Richard Greener, as you said, if someone had, you know, been able to, you know, keep that legacy going, it could have been a whole new thing. So, of course, he was a librarian. Uh, his daughter ended up being a librarian also. Mm -hmm. So tell us how... Um, you know, without giving up all of the, the story, the book, if for anyone who hasn't read it, um, how did she then become connected with J.P. Morgan? Marie? So, um, Belle de Costa Green, you know, once her family had um, sort of over time decided to pass, and there was sort of a schism between her mother and father on that topic, um, she decided, unlike her sibling, her sisters, um, who became teachers, she wanted to become a librarian. And she, um, passing, of course, she uh, secured a role as a librarian at Princeton University. Oh, wow. Princeton at that time was um, probably the most segregated Ivy League. They did not admit Black students. Um, they certainly wouldn't have hired a Black person in a professional role. So she had successfully passed in order to secure that position. While she was there, she developed an interest in rare and priceless manuscripts, and she became very friendly with Junius Morgan, who was J.P. Morgan's nephew. Um, he was a donor. He was a collector of of rare and priceless manuscripts. He was at the library very often. Um, and when his uncle, who he had advised on his collection, was looking for a personal librarian to really um, coordinate, help run the, the building he was building in New York City, his personal library, um, he thought of Belle for the role. So he um, introduced Belle and JP 
Um, we know exactly when that happened, the state of the library when that happened. Um, and we know as a result of that meeting, he decided to hire her. Um, there were a lot of white men in contention for the role, but Belle with her brilliance, her knowledge of rare and priceless manuscripts, her wit, um, she was able to secure the role. And then during the subsequent decades, she became really one of the most powerful people in the art world. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, talk about black girl magic, right? Uh, Victoria? Yeah. yeah. I, I always say that about her because mm -hmm. she did all of this when she didn't even have the right to vote. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Very and she cool. became one very of the most powerful right. women. Yeah, yeah. She had very few, as a woman, she had very few rights. And so she didn't see her often a play off of one of Marie's books. She was often the only woman in the room. Yeah. Uh, but, but it didn't talk about the magic. I always say, Black girl magic when it came to Bella Costa Green. Yeah. yeah. She couldn't hide that. Even though she was passing, she could Right, right, right. And yeah. that to me says so much. You know, uh, you still are who you are, who you even are. Yeah. regardless of what you look like. Your you ness, your yes. uniqueness, mm -hmm. your ancestry will still yes. come through. Yeah. Yeah. I always say that there are little hints in the book to me um, that show that they were a black family like they all <laughs> lived together that is something that is so common in a black yeah. you know we have the brother the sister-in-law the kids everybody just living together that is a black thing yeah. so i often laugh about that because i was like they couldn't even hide their blackness <laughs> um you can't you they could hide it on the outside but they couldn't hide who they were on the inside yeah yeah you still have to know who made the potato salad regardless <laughs> <laughs> yes Yes. We're talking to Victoria Christopher Murray and uh, Marie Benedict about their book, The Librarian. They'll actually be in Columbia, South Carolina uh, later on this month to do a book signing to talk about the book. Uh, we'll tell you more about that in just a short short. I'm Trey Taylor and uh, you're watching Coping. Hey, don't forget, scrolling at the bottom of the screen, uh, like we mentioned at the beginning of the show, all types of information, resources, including COVID testing, vaccinations, also uh, job opportunities, financial uh, opportunities. If you need some help with that. So don't forget to post and share so we can get the message to the masses. Uh, so uh, we, were, we were talking, of course, about um, Belle LaCosta, Be Belle Marion Greener, and uh, we're talking about the book, The Librarian, about uh, this woman who uh, in the 1800s passed but became a major influence with uh, J.P. Morgan, helping him build his wealth and power. Was he appreciative of what she was helping him do because he, black woman aside she was still a woman as you said victoria couldn't vote had very little rights did he appreciate and recognize how much of an influence she was for him oh yes, yes. definitely she became one of the most the closest person probably in his life to him but he wouldn't have released his checkbook to her mm -hmm. if, if he didn't yeah. trust her he had her out there collecting all kinds of things for him, all kinds of rare manuscripts and art for him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she had an unlimited budget. He was one of the wealthiest, powerful men in the world, and she had an unlimited budget <laughs> to procure whatever she thought was necessary to make his collection one of the best in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and we think, um, although, you know, there's no writings to this effect, but that shows how much he trusted her, yeah. valued her, that he was sending her out into the world as his emissary and as his negotiator and advocate. Was she compensated? Um, well? Very well. Very, very well. well. Yeah. Very well. Very well paid. And, and even when he passed away, he left her quite a bit of money in his will. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask that, Victoria. Did she, did he recognize her? You know, when he, he, he recognized mm -hmm. her. Yes. He she recognized was, her. We don't know if he recognized her as black or white, but at some point it didn't matter to him yeah. because she was so valuable to him. Right. Right. She was one of the only people that got, besides immediate family members, that got a, a bequest from him in his will. She was that important to him. Yeah, that says a lot. That says that even mm -hmm. possibly, uh, not only professionally, they may have been even personally close. Mm -hmm. Not not saying yeah. that they were romantic. I'm just right. saying. Well, we don't even know that. You know, right. we don't know. There was only yeah. um. She there was an interview once where someone asked her about her involvement and the rumors that they were um, romantically yeah. involved. And her answer, her response was, "We tried." And Marie and I, 
We're like, what does that mean? We had to, in, we had to interpret that for the whole book. And so we had our own interpretation of that. What do you interpret? Look, what do you interpret? <laughs> as we well, we don't want to give, we Listen, don't girl, give that I've away. To date many men and it just didn't work out. <laughs> right. Yeah, we don't want to give too much away. Some right, people will right. read that in the book. Yeah. Right. Because he was married, wasn't he? Yes, but that didn't yeah. stop him. Mm -hmm. well. Oh, it never. No, I want that's never a deterrent. <laughs> yeah, he had he had many women. There were yeah. many women in his life. And I would think so. He was a bon vivant. He was a man of my town. He was rich, powerful, yeah. and successful. And not only could get any woman he would want, many women, I'm sure, were right there wanting yeah. to be with him. And yeah. I would think, and again, I'm just, you know, thinking, because she was probably beautiful and smart. Yes, yes. And he yes. admired that about her. That's what he had yes. to be mm -hmm. an attraction to. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. Oh yes, we yeah. we um without giving anything away, we mm -hmm. we think there was an attraction. Now, what did they do with that attraction? Right. You'll have to read the book and find out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the book is called The Librarian. I hear uh, you can't get it at the library because all Ooh. of the copies are are gone. So you've got to get on the waiting list, or you can purchase the book. The book is yes. for purchase too. You don't have to. You can have this um and and in your own personal. Um, in your own personal library at, at your home. So uh, check out uh, the book, The Librarian, uh, Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Mary. Um, so what happened to um, Belle? Uh, did she ever, obviously at some point she got found out or she stopped passing. Tell us a little bit about, no? Wow. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No. Yeah, she, um, she, there were lots of rumors about Belle's identity throughout her lifetime. Um, there's all sorts of newspaper profiles of her in which her exotic complexion is discussed. Wow. But nobody could ever make that connection between she and her father, Richard T. Greener. He was famous also during her lifetime. He was very right. well known. And he was known as a, a black man who was a civil rights activist. So that was the connection she could never make. That's why she changed her, her last name. Um, and during her lifetime, she was successful in keeping that that separate. When she died, um, she burned all of her correspondence. Um, mm. So that to the extent that there was some record of her identity, it was gone, um, with the exception of a collection of letters um, with a man who was many things to Belle. We'll leave it at that. Um, her her real identity did not become known until much later, till decades later. She died in the 1940s. Um, in the 1990s, a biographer of J.P. Morgan actually knowing of the friendship and work relationship between uh, JP and Bell found a census document. I think that's what it was in which Bell was listed as colored. And that kind of opened up the floodgates um, of yeah. research. And it, by 2008, when um, uh, her Bell's biographer, Heidi Artizoni wrote an illuminated life, uh, she had really uncovered a whole wealth of information, not just about the fact that Bell passed, but about Richard T. Greener and Bell's mother who, was equally interesting. Her mother's family, the Fleet family, came from a multi-generational free community of color. They had been um, living this sort of very cultured, rich, professional, well-educated existence in DC for a long time. And, and for us, for Victoria and I, exploring those things were really important to show the nature of her upbringing, the nature yeah. of her identity, and the nature of her sacrifice. Um, she had to really kind of give all that up, at least publicly, in order to, to have the success in the life that she led. But um, yeah, that's, no, her identity was never really um, fully revealed during her lifetime. Yeah. So how did you ladies find out about Belle and why did you want to tell her story? Yeah, so actually Marie found out about Belle and then Marie found me. So she's done a lot of discovery. <laughs> yeah, I've been digging Belle out. So um, I actually came across Belle uh, many decades ago. I was a lawyer in New York City and um, I'd always loved history and the untold perspectives and voices of the past. And I was considering a shift and I happened to be at the Morgan Library, which I visited a lot. It's really one of the most beautiful libraries in the world. It's like a jewel box in there. Um, and a docent happened to mention Bell to me. There wasn't any um, really evidence of Bell around at that time, um, but this docent mentioned that um, this magnificent collection, really one of the world's best, 
it wasn't due to just JP Morgan. It was due to this remarkable woman, Belle DeCosta yeah. Green. Yeah. And I kind of added her name to my list of someone I might, because that's what I read. I read about historical women. And it wasn't until years later, decades later, that the truth about Belle started to become known. And I realized that Belle's story, which was already remarkable, was like so much more remarkable. And um, I also knew that I couldn't tell the story alone, um, that Belle, who had been in hiding for so long, deserved to have a Black woman tell her story too. Yeah. And even though I write fiction about a huge array of women, I cannot imagine what it's like to be a Black person in our society. And so it was around that time that I read uh, Victoria's, well, she's written many novels, but uh, a <laughs> really important one that everyone needs to read, which is called Stand <laughs> the Ground. And it's a, about the terrible problem in our country of the shooting of young Black men. Um, and she told this story through the perspective of the women, which I'd never really seen done before. And I just felt this kinship. And so even though we had never met, I was made the bold move of reaching out to her through our agents. I love it. She might be interested yeah. in exploring the story with me. And when she reached out to me, she just sent me a three page synopsis of the story idea. And my agent didn't tell me anything. So she just said, kind of read this, see if you'd be interested. The first thing I did was Google Marie Benedict. And right, I found yeah. out that she wrote um, historical fiction about these women who've been lost in the folds of history. Great stories, but what did that have to do with me? I, had right. read, I write contemporary novels. And then I mm -hmm. called my agent back and I said, has Marie ever seen a picture of me? Like, <laughs> is she looking for a different Victoria Christopher? Right, Ray? right, right. And so my agent said, no, she's looking to collaborate with a Black writer. Um, and it still took me about three months to read the the proposal because the first page was just about J.P. Morgan. And I right. wasn't interested in him. Right, right. And I always tease Marie that she hid the lead because the very <laughs> last paragraph said, and no one knew that Belle de Costa Green was Black <laughs> until she passed away. The ding, ding, uh, ding. And, yeah, and so she wrote it like a series on TV, like the cliffhanger, you know, like who <laughs> shot JR. Right. And so that's what she, that's how she wrote it. And at the end, I couldn't wait to call her. And yeah. that's how we got together. Yeah, awesome, awesome. I love this. I love this. Uh, the Personal Librarian is the story of Bella DaCosta Green, the New York Times bestseller, tells the story of her passing as white while helping financier uh, J.P. Morgan build his personal manuscript and art collection. Join authors Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray at the Richland County Public Library Thursday, September 8th, 6.30 in the Richard T. Greener Lecture at the library. And uh, it will be moderated by Augusta Baker, endowed chair. Dr. Nicole Cook and a book signing will follow. It is sponsored by the Richland Public Library, Augusta Baker Endowed Chair, and the Center for Innovation and Inclusion in Higher Education. This is a part of their Let's Talk Race program, which also made possible thanks to funding from Dominion Energy Charitable Foundation. And it is going to be right in front of um, the uh, Bella's dad's statue which is on the campus of the university of south carolina it is such a fascinating story ladies and i'm so glad you ended up reading till the end victoria <laughs> yeah, I, i'm so glad too i really am i almost messed yeah. this up <laughs> so. but look your black girl magic told you the right time you know i think timing is everything it, it really is because yeah because the way this has worked out the timing could yeah. not have been I think we needed that like three month break before we moved forward so that we mm -hmm. where we could end up. Yeah. So that's right. my story. I'm sticking to that. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You weren't ignoring her. You were I wasn't you. ignoring you. No, See, Marie, no. I was waiting for the right time. Right time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Marie Benedict, Victoria, Christopher Murray, thank you so much for uh, coming on and joining us. Thank you so much for this great, what I think is the beginning of many more collaborations. Oh, it is. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. And, and many more great works for us to uh, read and enjoy and learn from. So much more that we've got to learn from. That's the fascinating thing about life and about history. There's still so much more to learn. And we yes. thank you ladies for giving us that. Again, don't forget to go to the Richland County Public Library website and find out more about the book and also about the signing on September 8th. I'm Trey Taylor. We'll be right back with more coping. Thank you, ladies. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.
Computers, they're a part of our everyday lives. But when they're not working, they're an everyday problem. So call Computers Unique, your everyday solution. 803-351-5821. Is your computer running slow? Won't turn on? Do you need a screen replaced? Or maybe you just need another computer? Well, Computers Unique is your one-stop shop for all your computer needs. They have a wide variety of new and pre-owned PCs, Macs, and tablets. So call Computers Unique, Dutch Square Mall. 803-351-5821. 803-351-5821. Hi, I'm Mr. Deputy Addy Perez with the Richland County Sheriff's Department Community Action Team. As a mother, I know it's important to take care of my health for those I care about. Part of doing that is knowing my risk for developing type 2 diabetes. So if I was you, I'll take the opportunity to visit inittogethersc.org and take an online test to find out if you have prediabetes. Again, the website is inittogethersc.org. This message is brought to you by the Diabetes Action Council of South Carolina. Hey, thank you again so much for joining us today for coping with Trey Taylor, because we will always be coping with something. I want to thank our guests, Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Mary, for joining us. An amazing story about Bella LaCosta Green, the New York Times bestseller, tells the story of her passing as white while helping financier J.P. Morgan build his personal manuscript. These ladies are going to be at the Richland County Library in Columbia, South Carolina, the main branch downtown. Columbia, Thursday, September 8th, 6.30. They'll be meeting and greeting, talking about the story. You can get a signed, autographed copy of the book, uh, talk to these ladies, and so much more. The name of the book is The Personal Librarian. Pick it up, go to the event, and enjoy. Listen, if you have a story or initiative that could help someone cope, please email booking at copingwithtraytaylor.com. If you have a product or service that could help someone cope, please email copingwithtraytaylor at gmail.com. We would love for you to be a proud sponsor, just like In It Together SC and the Diabetes Action Council. They sponsor Wellness Wednesday every Wednesday here on Coping with Trey Taylor. Our other sponsors include Javis Financial Services. Also, uh, Computers Unique, Dutch Square Mall, the Fifth Circuit Solicitor's Office Attorney, Byron Gibson, Palmetto Media Connections, the Comet Bus System, Black Pages, Black Expo, Agape Counseling and Training Services, and of course, Computers Unique, Dutch Square Mall. Now, coming up next week, we've got so much great stuff coming up for you. Of course, we've got Wellness Wednesday. Uh, we're going to talk with Dr. Helmut Albrecht about monkeypox. You know, there's been an a case detected in South Carolina. He's going to tell us more about that. And we've got some more great stuff coming up. Don't forget, this is my birth month, as a matter of fact, but we are giving you the prizes. That's right. Uh, my birthday is September 13th, and we're giving it away 13. Teen prizes. A couple of ways that you can do that. You can like, share, follow, and subscribe to us on Trey Taylor, Taylor Made Productions, on several of the uh, media outlets. Uh, share the post if you see it on Facebook, Instagram, and then comment done. Now, if you're watching the show, I'm going to start doing some trivia questions. That's another way you can win. I've got 13 fabulous prize packs. Uh, comedian George Wallace is uh, going to donate some stuff. Jay Anthony Brown is going to donate some hot sauce. We also have tickets from WOW Productions. Dr. Nicole Edwards has a spa. She's going to give us some gift certificates. Uh, Sabrini Products, hair and skin products, has given us some beautiful gift packages. European Wax Center, my girlfriend Vanessa. English has some gift certificates for you to get your first wax free. Um, also artisan bath body. So many great things that we've got in those prize packages and we want you to be a winner. So going out to social media, please like, share and follow us on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. Uh, share the post, comment done, and then watch the show because we've got a chance for you to win additionally by answering some trivia contests, uh, answers, questions. <laughs> That's right. It's my birth month and you have going to get the gifts. That's all going on this month. As usual, we leave you with a spiritual reading today. It says, living in dependence on me is a glorious adventure. Most people scurry around busily trying to accomplish things through their own strength and ability. Some succeed enormously, others fail miserably, but both groups miss what life is meant to be. Living 
in collaboration with me. When you depend on me continually, your whole perspective changes. You see miracles happening all around while others only see natural occurrences and coincidences. You begin each day with joyful expectation, watching to see what I will do and knowing whatever it is, I'm with you. I put that in. <laughs> you accept weakness as a gift from me, knowing that my power plugs in most readily to consecrated weakness. You keep your plans tentative, knowing that my plans are far more superior. You consciously live, move, and have your being in me, designed that I live in you. I live in you and you in me. This is the intimate adventure I offer for you. That's your Jesus Calling reading for today, September 2nd, 2022. I'm Trey Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us today on Coping. We're giving you info and advice to help you thrive and survive in life because we'll always be coping with something. Take care. God bless. Stay well. And if you're going to be out and about, especially inside, don't forget to wear your mask over your nose and under your chin. We'll see you soon. Promoting learning what you can do Six ways to a better you Coping Find peace of mind to survive